Hi everybody, I'm Heather Dawson. Every week on our show, we bring you the best of California. The new luxury ship Carnival Splendor is 113,000 tons. Just to put it in perspective, that's almost three times the size of the Titanic. The largest fun ship ever constructed is truly a city in itself cruising on the ocean. If the size alone isn't impressive enough, check out what's on board. A casino, fine dining, entertainment, babysitting at Camp Carnival, a big slide, Cloud Nine Spa, and an amazing sunset every night. They even have a captain straight out of the love boat. They make me uh, sizzle, as one of the ladies said. You know? <laughs> but other than that, it's, uh, it's, it's fun. But he's not just a pretty face. After 22 years as a captain, he's seen a lot of changes. Remember the image of the captain behind a big wheel? Well, thanks to technology, the bridge now looks more like the controls of a rocket ship. Now, when I walked in here, I have to say I'm a little old school. I'm imagining the big, you know, wheel and you standing behind it. But, I mean, this is a lot of, you know, different technology that you yes. use. Yeah, you know, the, the big wheel has been, uh, um, let's say, uh, dismissed down the year. Because now it's more, uh, as you know, the technology is uh, progressing every year. And uh, now we're having a little, uh, little Gugart uh, wheel and a uh, few joysticks that can control and do the same function that the big wheel used to do at the time. So there is no need for us to sit in behind the wheel all the time. Now that you know you're in good hands, let's find out who takes care of all the fun we keep hearing about. That's this man, cruise director John Heald. We carry more senior citizens than any other cruise line, we carry more children than any other cruise line and everything in the middle. And uh, often we have high school reunion groups and those are some of my favorites, you know, people who haven't seen each other for 30 years and they come on board and they meet and, and we have uh, special areas for them to meet and greet and it's, it's a wonderful thing to see. With more than 200 activities starting at 9 o'clock in the morning, there's something to do for everyone. There's also a cruise for every budget and schedule. So long sailing, bye -bye sailing. Now for our special Spotlight segment. One of the biggest business successes in American history got its humble start in the Inland Empire, and today it's known worldwide. David Wiley traces Southern California origins of Mickey D's. Many people don't realize that San Bernardino is actually kind of the fast food capital of the world. Many of the most popular fast food restaurants got started here, including the very first McDonald's. It was 1948, and brothers Mac and Dick McDonald had actually closed their barbecue burger joint, only to reopen as the very first McDonald's restaurant at 14th and E Street in San Bernardino. With speedy service and 15 cent hamburgers, little did they know they would be starting a fast food revolution. While Ray Kroc is often credited with much of McDonald's success, it was the McDonald's brothers who initially had the customers lined up to gobble down their tasty burgers and fries. Today, the original building is long gone, but the 1953 sign that launched an icon of American business remains at 14th and E, and with it, an unlikely story of a local businessman who's preserving McDonald's historic ties to San Bernardino. It was back in 1998 that the site was facing foreclosure when Albert Okura, the founder of the Juan Pollo rotisserie chicken restaurant chain, came to the rescue and purchased the building. Yeah, I read the paper one day, it said the history for sale. Uh, the uh, historic side of the original McDonald's for sale, nobody wants it, it was in foreclosure. And at that time they had 20 different escrows and they kept dropping out. So I, I came, I read that paper, I jumped, I just jumped, I bought that the next day. And when I got out, got, got out of escrow, you know, I, what I did was I turned this into an actual uh, McDonald's museum, unofficial McDonald's museum. We have a, the only collection of pre-Ray Kroc McDonald's memorabilia that anyone has. And plenty of other McDonald's items that are sure to spark memories for both young and old alike. Okura does hope to further restore the historic McDonald's sign, complete with a new set of golden arches. 
The old ones were removed in a legal dispute between the McDonald's and Ray Kroc. In the meantime, the museum is located at 14th and E along Route 66 in San Bernardino. It is open daily from 10 to 5. Admission is free. As for Okura, he's hoping to replicate some of McDonald's success for himself. I mean, everyone that uh, comes to visit the museum, everyone talks to me, they always are going to find out about Juan Pollo restaurants. Because you know, my goal is to end up in the chicken what Ray Kroc did in the hamburgers. So whether traveling Route 66 or just visiting the Inland Empire, make sure you come by and check out a real piece of Americana, the original historic site of the very first McDonald's right here in San Bernardino. I'm David Wiley for California Life. For better or for worse, those famous wedding vows don't mean as much as they used to. Oftentimes, the worse ends up overshadowing the better. But a San Diego pastor hopes to reverse that trend. Here's Tom Jordan with the story. I take you to be my wife, to love and cherish you. The familiar phrase. For better or for worse. We've sat through it. We might have even said it and meant it. <laughs> But living it out day by day, year after year, well, sometimes it's easier said than done. I think you look at the divorce rate, you look at the number of people that might still be in a marriage, but their marriage is miserable. Bob Botsford is the pastor of Horizon Christian Fellowship in Rancho Santa Fe. Guys, this is what God is wanting all of us in the room to grow into. Preaching scripturally based how-to messages, he says life's challenges, including family issues, takes more than just applying technique or advice or even counsel. But gals, you got to roll and it is a key role. This is about a relationship and getting that relationship back on track for the better in, in a relationship in the middle of a marriage where God can be a part of the equation. So Botsford authored For Better, a 30-day devotional book aimed at getting not just marriages but whole families back on track. Day-by-day -day readings for spouses, dads, moms, and kids. People don't have a lot of time but a little bit of time in the morning and a bite-sized word from God that can help them with the problems that they're faced with. Never before have we seen so much attention being given to family and marriage issues in the form of books. And there's good reason for that. Statistics on family dysfunction are alarming. A family nonprofit group based in El Cajon says that about half of all marriages now end in divorce. Many more marriages are unfulfilling or considered unhappy. And the effects hit kids hard. 50% of single moms receive no child support. Their children do not see their fathers on a regular basis. 38% of all 8th graders have experimented with illicit drugs. Botsford says it takes about 30 days to form a good habit, hence the 30-day format for his book. He says it's not always easy. It takes effort. Relationship. But the daily habit-generating process is well worth it. The families that will do this in 30 days, it'll be for the better. And coming up next, our next guest was born into an iconic American family, but has made a name for herself by helping others, including moms-to-be. She tells us what makes her so passionate, next in our California Profile. Are you a small business owner and you're wondering how to keep your business safe on the internet? Then don't go anywhere, because coming up on California Life, we've got Bill Rancic here to give us tips for cyber safety. Small businesses make up nearly 100% of the businesses in America. And did you know how vulnerable those businesses can be to cyber attacks? Joining us today is Bill Ranzik, who's here to give us cyber safety tips, courtesy of AT&T. Welcome, Bill. Thanks for joining us. You know, you're a really recognizable face, but what a lot of people might not realize is that you actually started off as a small business owner. Am I right? Yeah, I started when I was uh, 23 years old as a, in a small studio apartment with a buddy of mine and uh, just kind of built from there. Small businesses are kind of vulnerable to cyber attacks. Do you know anything about that? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. Small business owners are, are probably the most vulnerable of them all out of all the business sectors out there because they don't have the IT department and all the layers in place that these big corporations have. So oftentimes they fall victim to cyber attacks and, and when they do, it can be devastating. Oftentimes they never reopen their doors after. So how can somebody protect themselves then? Well, I've teamed up with AT&T. We created a, a simple checklist, three things that all small business owners should do. And one is just keep it clean. Make sure your PC is clean and your mobile device and your servers are clean. And if you have the latest antivirus software installed, you're gonna be in good shape. Secondly, you gotta back up your data. And there's great companies out there like AT&T that offer affordable online data backup. There's no reason why you shouldn't do it because 
because if something does happen, you've got everything in a safe, secure location. And lastly, you gotta educate yourself and educate your employees on what to look for and what to avoid when out there because nowadays with social media, there's so many ways that we can fall victim to cyber attacks. We've gotta be very cautious. When you say clean up, what do you mean by that? Because I, I get a lot of these pop-ups and they say to clean your Mac and I don't know what they are. I don't actually click on them because I think that those are um, you know, spyware or something, but what is that? You've got to seek it out rather than going to the pop-ups. Getting the latest antivirus software is critical. So I'm a small business owner and I just had a cyber attack. What do I do next? Hopefully you've got all your data backed up. An interesting survey just came out and it said, when you are attacked as a small business owner, it costs an average of $9,000 to recover from that. And that's a lot of money as a small business owner. So I think the, the key is being proactive rather than reactive. And when you put the proper channels in place, you're not gonna fall victim to it. Bill, all those tips seem simple and straightforward. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, have a good day. For more information, just visit at and Backslash safeguard. Bringing you the best of California. I'm Gabrielle D'Addario for California Life. Shirley Hickman was born and raised in a Colorado coal mining town and wrote about those years in her first book, Don't Give Up. She recently published her third book, Sarah Darling, which depicts the early days in San Francisco during the Gold Rush era. Apart from writing novels, Shirley is also a published poet with three awards for her nonfiction works under her belt. She also founded Porterville Writers Workshop, which is located in Central California. My latest novel is called Sarah Darling. It's a romance novel and it won first prize at the Oak Tree Press. The book is really a typical romance, and where I got the idea of this was I was very interested in reading romance novels because I like a happy ending, and so do most people. In fact, the amount of money made just last year on romance novels alone was over a billion dollars. What intrigues people about romance novels is they want something where they know that there's going to be romance and they know that at the end they're going to have a happy ending. And that, of course, Sarah Darling is involved in that too. It takes place during the gold rush in San Francisco and Sarah works at the Jenny Lynn Theater as a singer. Because there are so few women in San Francisco at that time, she is bombarded with proposals of marriage, with people wanting to wine and dine her, and she is not interested in any of them until she meets charming Richard Moresby, who is the most handsome man she's ever met. Shirley Hickman successfully brings her characters to life in Sarah Darling, blending romance and intrigue in this charming story of a music house singer and an English lord named Richard. Before Sarah and Richard can declare their love, they must deal with prejudice, a murder trial, a lynching party, a fire, and a terrible secret from Sarah's past. I did a lot of research before I actually wrote the book and as I was writing it because you do have to be accurate. Also one of the kind of fun things about writing the book is you can take a fictional character and put them alongside of a real person. For example, the Jenny Lynn Theater where Sarah is singing was an actual theater and Tom McGuire who built that theater and managed it above the Parker House Saloon was a real person. The reason he called his theater the Jenny Lynn was because he was enamored of the songstress Jenny Lynn and hoped that if he named a theater after her, that someday she would sing at his theater. Readers will not only feel a part of San Francisco, but also the characters sharing the heartache of Ireland's famine and the attitudes of English aristocracy in a very personal way. Be sure to get a copy of Sarah Darling at your local bookstore today. Bringing you the best of California, I'm Patrick Dudiak for California Life. For much of her life, Sharon Cauldron has been a caregiver for her children, her friends, and her parents. I had an Asperger's son, and then my mother got Alzheimer's and came to live with us. And then I had three relatives that had terminal cancer, so I juggled for about 15, 20 years. But now, Sharon is the one who needs care. About a year ago, Sharon developed a deadly blood infection that nearly killed her. When she awoke in the hospital, she was alive, but she had lost all of her limbs and parts of her face and tongue. When I tried to turn over the first time and my, my feet were too heavy to turn, and then I went to reach and my hands were black. I, it wasn't my hands. 
just like that. Now out of the woods for only a few months, Sharon is moving quickly to regain her independence. She's receiving two bionic hands called eye digits from Touch Bionics in Dayton, Ohio. But these hands having, having mobile joints, being able to move, being controlled myoelectrically, um, will get her very close. You just have to keep pushing forward with the abilities that you have to make a difference for others and around you and to help the ones you love. For Sharon, the results are immediate. 50%. Yeah, keep going. That's better. Keep going. Yes, and now relax. Okay. Good job. The fact that her um, her, her outlook is bright, she's very motivated, it's going to really help her um, train to be able to use these devices right away. Biggest barrier for her using those hands is going to be getting her insurance to pay for it like they should, um, which even with this set of hands, they have thrown up every roadblock. Um, they said, we're not saying no, but we're not saying yes either. They said it was just something they weren't going to give a predetermination on and that we had to make them give them to her and then bill the insurance to find out if they'd pay for it. Sharon will need to keep her positive attitude because she has a long road ahead of her. Yes. Someone's just got to take it nice and slow and understand there's going to be incremental gains um, and that it's a huge adjustment for a lot of different reasons. And now, but keeping a positive attitude is part of Sharon's DNA. I'll be actually able to, to go back and find another job and, and do things again, you know, because I'll have hands, <laughs> just like I did, you know, which is A-OK. -okay. <laughs> and then fifth. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes, that's the real stuff. Yeah, there it is. Oh. Loaf the rock. That's what I like to see. <laughs> According to a new survey commissioned by Emerson, 62% of Americans didn't realize leftovers and other food waste are piling up in landfills. From there, this volume of food is sitting and breaking down. It's releasing a lot of methane gas, and this contributes to global warming. Home remodeler and designer Lori March says there's already a solution in most kitchens. The best place for our food waste is actually in a disposer in your sink. From here, they grind up, head into your plumbing, and go into a wastewater management system or a septic system. Lori clears up a common garbage disposal myth. There are actually no blades in a disposer. There are two little pieces in there called impellers. Now they're taking your food scraps, pushing them all around the outside of your disposer. There are little tiny holes there, and they grind up your food waste, kind of like a cheese grater works. From there, it runs through your system. The best place to find out more about disposers is in sinkerator.com. These guys invented the disposer, and it's a wonderful spot to learn about the environmental benefits of using a disposer over putting food scraps in a landfill. It's 80 years old this year, and it, uh, it just runs beautifully. 1912 DDO. It is a French car with an American body. Since it is a 1912, it has a V8 engine in it. Uh, the engine is a four liter, produces well, somewhere between 25 and 30 horsepower. This is a 1929 Auburn boat tail, and uh, it's just one of the few that are left, and we fully done a restoration on this car in the last year and a half. And that's it for us. If you missed any part of our show, go to our website, CaliforniaLifeHD.com. Also, send us your best shot of California, and we'll air it with our credits. We'll see you next time. Watch us on our YouTube channel. Stay connected to our social media like our blogs on Facebook, follow our tweets on Twitter, and check out our posts on Instagram and Pinterest, where we bring you the best of California.